welcome back, everybody. I'm J.B. Shreve, and you're listening to the Faithful Considerations Podcast, and we are at episode number two of our Days of David podcast series. So in our last episode, we looked at the settings and the times that David was born into, the days of the judges. When we open up the Bible, up to the story of David in 1 Samuel, that's where we're looking at. And when we looked at Ruth, this, uh, this Moabite woman, in a short four-chapter book kind of love story that seems out of place in the context of books around the Bible, until you understand the significance of Ruth in the lineage of David, and then ultimately, of course, in the lineage of Jesus. So right out of the gate, we're seeing rules broken in the story of David. That's what we talked about in the last episode, when we see this special destiny, this this place of Ruth, this Moabite woman in the story of David, the story of Jesus, all of that. So we're going to see that again, and again, and again, and again. It's one of my favorite parts about the story of David, this everything, all the rules get broken here. But today... We turn to one of my favorite figures in the Old Testament. This guy was a game changer, literally. The last of the judges. He transitions Israel from the time of the judges to the times of the monarchy in the days of David. So the books in the Bible, which the story of David is documented within, they're actually named after him. And that's what we're going to look at today as we turn in this episode to the story of Samuel. developments with Ruth, with uh, the, the birth of David's father, Jesse, all of that that we looked at in the last episode, really, that's all in the background here. If you're living in the times of the judges, you probably wouldn't notice that story. You probably, you honestly wouldn't even care. All right. This is the time of the judges. Instability, fear, they're, they're everywhere, shaking Israelite society from one generation to the next. And the inclusion of a Moabite grandma in the house of this family in Bethlehem it's hardly worth mentioning until later on when we realize who her descendants are going to be. What the Israelites don't realize, though, is that the era of the judges, it's actually about to come to an end. The last of the judges is this guy named Samuel. Now, Samuel's story is powerful. In the course of Scripture, usually we don't, we don't learn a lot about the childhood years of our characters, our, our heroes in the Bible. When we do, though, when we get a glimpse, a a peek, it's really of extra benefit because usually those tidbits let us into the secrets of their development, right? Their their humanness that we can relate to before they became the great men and women of old. And we should still relate to them, even in their heroic deeds. The book of James says that Elijah was a man just like us. When we read about the ancient heroes of our faith, we should hear the stories of our brothers, our our ancient cousins, our uncles, our aunts. They did what we can also do. And it's worth considering that the heroic tales they're known for to this day, well, those heroic tales usually represent their best day. (laughs) We should keep that in mind. They learned obedience to God along the way, just like we have to. Samuel's childhood is an example of that. All right. Most likely, he was born to a a God-fearing Levite family. These were the priests of Israel. And the Israelites conquered the land. They they set up homes in different sectors among the the Israelite tribes, right? The, The Levites did. The Levites didn't get their inheritance in the promised land, all right? Their inheritance, this is what's written in the Bible, their inheritance was God. So they didn't get any land of their own. That was the Lord's instruction for this, what was to be the priestly tribe. Well, Samuel's father and mother lived in the land of Benjamin, but he was a Levite. And this is interesting to me because we don't think of Samuel that way. We don't think of him as a priest. We think of him as a judge, as a prophet. That was the calling on his life, and it superseded his biological inheritance, his lineage. The whole world shifts. The whole world of Israel and the story of God's people shifts under the final judgeship of this guy, Samuel. We're going to move from the era of judges to the era of the kings, but we're going to see the prophets in a new way too. Now, there were prophets before this. Moses was a prophet. So was Aaron. The story of the judges, there's, it's sprinkled with different stories of prophets there. But Samuel is the first one to occupy an office, I guess you could say, an office of the prophet. Before all is said and done, he even has a school of the prophets. Samuel does. Even as he inaugurates a reformation in Israel, then the monarchy, then a new monarchy. Samuel always seems to stand kind of separate 
from the politics that he speaks into and, 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 and advises and judges. His whole life, not only his prophetic words, but his whole life seemed to stand as a standard against which the nation learns to be guided, to rise up and to meet that this standard. Just a powerful story, a powerful man and his representation of a dimension of God's design. Now, there are several points in the story of Samuel where you can recognize he held a certain gravitas, I guess you would you would call it, a spiritual mass. And that spiritual mass tended to terrify people. Later in our story, when he goes to Bethlehem to secretly anoint David as king, we find the elders of the town of Bethlehem. They go out to meet him at the gate. And the Bible says they're literally trembling when they meet him. This is 1 Samuel 16, 4. I'll just read it here. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Now, this isn't a jolly guy. This isn't a fun-loving guy. That's not who Samuel was. This is a guy filled with the Spirit of God, and his presence has brought order to the land in his generation. That's what a judge does, after all. But his loyalty isn't to the people. It's not to his own agenda. It's to God alone. And that standard, that uncompromising and unyielding standard, means anything can happen here. We'll see in his story that fierce commitment and devotion— Samuel had to the purposes of God. He, he confronts kings to their face. He confronts his own mentor. Even in death, his ghost, one of the weirdest stories in the Bible, strikes fear in the people that see him. That's all coming later, though. For now, we have to see the weight and significance of this prophet, this judge. And to understand how he came to be like this, we need to look at his story, the birth and the rise of Samuel. Now, if you've read the story, then you already know how it begins. His dad had two wives, all right? The first, has, the first wife has kids, but the second one, her name's Hannah, she doesn't. Hannah's name means favor, and the original language suggests uh, there's also a meaning or an implication of mercy within her name. I always like to look to the names of the people when I'm reading the, these stories in the Bible, what they mean in the original language when I read the stories. It's, it's like a, a secret pocket of treasure, for us to dig into and discover little nuggets, little secrets about what's what's being revealed in this story. So we know that Samuel's parents are God-fearing people because even in a reckless and tumultuous day of the judges, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, the Bible tells us that every year Hannah and her husband would go to Shiloh to offer sacrifices and worship God. Now, Shiloh was a city in the land of the tribe of Ephraim. The name Shiloh meant tranquility. And after the Israelites entered the promised land, captured a lot of it, that's where they set the tabernacle in Shiloh, the tent of meeting, the Ark of Covenant. They both set there. There's no temple yet, remember. So it's all centered at Shiloh at this point. Jerusalem isn't even controlled by the Israelites at this point in the journey, at this point in the story. But Hannah is in mourning, all right? She doesn't have any children. Her husband tries to console her, basically tells her, hey, look, I love you no matter what. What's it? it does no good. You know, you don't have to worry about these things, but that, that consoling her doesn't really take effect, right? She wants kids and, and she's not getting them. And so no matter what, she's feeling down. And so Hannah goes in to pray to God. And this part's really cool. Throughout the Old Testament, as if to mark transitions in the journey, we find different names of God along the way. So like in the story of Abraham, he knew a specific name for God, right? Moses, he knew another name for God. God even tells Moses, your, your ancestors didn't know me by this name. I'm telling you a new name of myself, right? And the journey reveals the names of God along the way as they travel. They come to know God more, and he reveals his names to them. Well, now Hannah introduces us to a name of God that hasn't been seen before in the Old Testament. This is in the first chapter of Samuel. She calls God by the name Lord of hosts when she prays. Now, even though it's the first time we see this name for God in the Bible, this Lord of hosts name, we're going to see it again in the story of David. It dominates. God is showing himself in a new way as he ushers in the ages of the kings and Israel. And this new revelation of God was ushered into the earth through the prayers of a mourning woman just wanting to have children. So when we get to the book of Revelation, holding to this theme, when you go all the way to the end of the story in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> It's the Lord of hosts that we encounter there. The same name of God, first spoken by Hannah, is the one that's on the scene in the final battle 
between light and darkness. And all of that comes about by this praying woman named Hannah just coming to God with her personal travails, her crisis, the burden that she was carrying in her own life. That was the channel God used to unveil this new revelation of himself to the world that would get humanity all the way to the end of time, to get us all to the all the way to the ushering in of the kingdom of God. That's pretty fascinating to me. Hannah prays to the Lord of hosts and says, if God will give her a son, she'll give him back. She pledges him as a Nazarite. In verse 11, 11 of chapter 1 in 1 Samuel, when she talked about how giving the baby to the Lord all the days of his life and never letting his hair be cut, well, that's the same vow that Samson was supposed to have lived under. Remember, he couldn't cut his hair? It's the Nazarite vow. No razors or shears will ever cut their hair. Keep that in mind when you visualize this guy Samuel in our story. As we go through the story, he likely had thick, long braids of, of all the hair through the years that had bulked up from the day of his birth until he died. And rather than big muscles and strength like God had given to the Nazarite judge Samson, a powerful spirit of prophecy and insight was given to Samuel. So this guy who met the elders at the, the gates of Bethlehem, when they came trembling before him, he wasn't just some rogue, long, white-bearded prophet. I'm, I'm Really, he would have to have had uh, his hair rolled up in braids and rolled up in, in dreadlocks and things like that. He was probably a fierce-looking dude, having never cut his hair or anything like that. So here we have Hannah praying this deeply moving, deeply spiritual prayer before God at Shiloh. And this prayer is introducing us to a new name, to a new understanding of God as Lord of hosts. And the fruit of this prayer is actually going to shift the history of the nation and the story of God into a new place because the birth of Samuel is coming through this prayer. But even as she's praying, we come across a new character. We meet a new character. His name is Eli. Now, Eli is the high priest in Israel at this time. Eli is the picture of a dysfunctional, lazy, apathetic religious leader. And I know it sounds like I'm being harsh. You can't overstate this. He's the picture of this dysfunctional, lazy, apathetic religious leader. Throughout these first few chapters of 1 Samuel, I find it interesting whenever we, we find Eli, whenever we, we are introduced to him in the story, he's always sitting down or lying down. He's never standing up. There's no active engagement from this man installed as a leader in the house of God. He knows what's right. He recognizes it when he sees it, when he hears it, as we'll see, but he doesn't do it. He's apathetic. Scripture even points out that he's fat. Now, if the Bible marks your place in history as a fat, lazy religious leader, that's saying something. That's not the mark you want to leave on eternity, on, or on mortality. That's not what you want to leave behind, right? Later on, we'll see that even when he eventually dies, he's crushed by his own weight. When he falls backward in his chair, he's sitting in, and the weight of his tubby butt snaps his neck. This is Eli. And if we need more evidence of how out of touch with the purposes of God Eli the high priest is, we don't have to look farther than his response to what Hannah is doing. Her, her powerful, her historical prayer here, this is how Eli responds as she lets loose her prayer before God at the altar, as she births this new age and reality in the earth, the age that the throne of David would eventually be set upon. Eli misses it entirely. Rather than encouraging what she's doing, what God's doing, Eli walks over and scolds the woman for being drunk. That's what he thinks is going on here. The spirit of God is birthing something right in front of him, and he thinks it's a drunken stupor. Talk about being out of touch. More evidence of Eli's inadequacy is the, the presence of his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. These two perverts operating in the office of priests in the place where people come to worship God, they're sleeping with women who worked in the entrance at the tent of meeting. They would st steal the, the offerings that people gave to God like lambs and sheep and take it for themselves to eat. They were like modern day megachurch pastors caught up in a scandal. And what did Eli do about this scandal and corruption among his own sons? He just sat there. That's what Eli does. Nothing. The Bible tells us he knew about their wicked acts, but he didn't correct them. He let the reputation of the house of God rot rather than take the action he needed to take. But change is coming because, as you know by now, God heard Hannah's prayer and she gives birth to the baby boy Samuel. And that name means God has heard. And indeed, he did hear. On the word and standards of this little infant born to heaven, or to ha Hannah, 
God would change the whole ball game. A quick pause in our episode to plug some stuff here. First, if you're enjoying this podcast episode, why don't you consider becoming a Patreon supporter of the podcast? For as little as a dollar a month, you can help us churn out more podcasts, but you'll also get access to our archives, not only at the archives of jbshreve.com, but also the end of history.net. So fans of history, people who want to keep posted on current events and the chaotic age that we live in, that's our sister site, theendofhistory.net. And so you'll like both of those things there. So you can become a Patreon supporter through a link at our website. It's on the right side of the page there at jbshreve.com. Or you can go directly to our Patreon page. It's patreon.com backslash jbshreve. Patreon.com backslash jbshreve. Check that out. Enjoy. And now back to the episode. So have you ever met a person who experienced some terrible tragedy, some terrible hardship in life, and they, as a result of that, they held some bitterness toward God about it? Maybe you've done that yourself. I don't know. Why, why did you do this to me, God? Why did you let this happen? Right? I remember a guy I was ministering to once. I didn't know his name, but I was praying for him, and I saw clear as day as I was praying over him an image of him as this high school or or college athlete. He had expectations for what lay ahead on that athletic track, but his knees got messed up, and his athletic career was over as a result. So he blamed God for that, and I could see that just as I was praying for him. And you know what? God was there. God was there in that tragedy. When his knees got messed up, God was right there with him. But the thing he blamed God for, that tragedy, the thing he blamed him for and couldn't find God in it, that was actually his salvation. God had a different path for him. And and the knee injury was what shifted him over toward the correct pathway, towards the design of God for his life. As long as he held on to his bitterness about that old knee injury from his playing days, he was never going to see it, though. Bitterness was, was, uh, was blinding him. And I get it. If we believe in a sovereign God, and and we should, then why would he let those experiences happen to us? Why would he allow betrayal, heartbreak, tragedy, whatever else strikes in our life? It makes sense kind of, right? It makes sense only if we see life and God through the lens of our personal experience. That's not the way we're supposed to see God. We can get to know him there, but our understanding of those experiences They've got to be tempered. They've got to be measured by the weight of the Word of God. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to be a a person who regularly gets into the Word of God. You absolutely cannot, will not know God unless you're in His Word. The early days of Samuel always shed light on this perspective or, or misperspective of God when you see the human realities behind these stories. This story isn't a legend. It's not a myth. This is a real man, just like you and me. He had to... He had to deal with things. In the first chapters of Samuel, we read that Hannah kept her vow to God after she gave birth to the little boy Samuel. She brought him to the tabernacle and committed him to the care of Eli. This is 1 Samuel 1, verses 24 to 28. It says, When the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. After sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give this boy, to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. That's pretty impressive. We learn that God blessed Hannah for her prayer, her faithfulness, and her sacrifice. In chapter 2, it says, But Samuel, this is verse 18 to 21, But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year his mother made him a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. Before they returned home, Eli would bless Elkanah, that's the husband, and his wife, and say, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of the one, this one she gave to the Lord. And the Lord blessed Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now, if we if we all see those verses in the testimony of Hannah's faithfulness, I contend we we might be missing a deeper story. What was it like for Samuel? Every year, his family would come visit him. His mom would bring him these little linen ephods. 
I think about how comfortable it would have been for this long-haired, acne-faced teenager to slide into this linen ephod and, and walk around the tabernacle in it. It's like it marked him as something different, something odd, even if it was given him, given to him with the best of intentions by his mom. Even worse, what was it like for him to see his folks come into the tabernacle of offerings every year? A happy family. Here's a new brother. Here's a new sister. You're never really going to get to know them because you belong here. You belong here because of some vow before God that you had no say in, but it impacted the whole of your life before you were even born. We're building a home. We're building traditions. We're building memories. And you, well, here's your ephod this year. How are things with Eli and his degenerate sons? This reality could have been cause for Samuel to grow up with bitterness towards God when you think about it. But there's no sign of that anywhere in this story. Nowhere in the story of Samuel do we see him grow bitter towards God, towards family, towards anyone. He could have been, he could have seen this as the, the tragic, unfair predicament of his life and blamed God, but he didn't. And this is key. He didn't blame God because he trusted God. He trusted God even in the face of things that he couldn't possibly have understood when he was a young boy. In the face of what must have at times seemed perplexing, depressing, daunting, Samuel opted for a different route. Rather than nurse those things in his mind, he praised God. He trusted in the goodness of God. He honored God. He honored Him with His words. But more importantly, Samuel honored God with his life. By the time he was a young boy, he had more spiritual mass within him than the high priest did. We're going to see this. That didn't happen by accident or, or, or by magic. Samuel had the call of God on his life for sure, but he also he made right decisions. In the beginning of those right decisions was in how he responded to the tragedies, or what could have been perceived as tragedies in his own life. Sometimes the worst day of our life is actually the day we were born into the purposes of God. We can't see things as man sees them. We can't see things through the lens of our self-will, through our desires, through our intentions and purposes. We have to see things as God sees them, and that level of perspective takes some seasoning to develop. Then there's also Hannah's sacrifice. It's easy to read over these words and assume we've got it. We captured the level of faithfulness here and move on. She gave over her much longed for baby, not only to God, but also to the house of Eli. And unless you've lived in a cave in the last couple of decades, you probably know about the the scandals in different major denominations and churches out there today. Major sex scandals in the Catholic Church. Major sex scandals in the U.S. Southern Baptist Church. I know some out there probably don't like me bringing those scandals up because it offends, but that's what if that's what bothers you about the scandals. I'd suggest there's probably a deeper thing going on in you that you not, might want to deal with. These were child abuse scandals, not just child sex abuse scandals, but the religious leaders covered them up, really pouring on the level of hypocrisy, pure evil right there. When I read the story of Eli's sons, these guys robbing the offerings of the tabernacle, sleeping and whoring with women who came to work at the house of God, I have to think of how difficult that would have been for Hannah to entrust her newborn son, not only to God, but to the house of Eli. It would have been like turning him over to one of these churches where the priest or the pastor had been molesting kids. And not only was that going on, but the leaders covered it up. But Hannah trusted God. Somehow she moved beyond the rumors and the fears and the depravity of the day. And she trusted the Lord of hosts to watch over the boy Samuel. And he, of course, had a special call on his own life. Now, whatever those first few years might have been like, the dangers posed by Eli and his sons to the development of the boy who who would become the prophet Samuel, they didn't last long. The judgment of God finally came. And as it came, it brought with it the call and the power of God on the life of the boy Samuel. Remember, Eli was aware of what his sons were doing. Chapter 2 in 1 Samuel even tells us that he talked to them about it, but he never stopped it. He let them know it was wrong, but, but he, the leading religious figure in the land, didn't do anything to stop it. And then this mysterious figure comes along. Now, we find guys like this throughout the book of Judges, and so it fits that he should show up here in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, when we're still in the, the age of the Judges, remember. He's a prophet of God, but we don't know who is who he is. He's nameless. He may have been a farmer. He may have been an, an elder of Israel. We don't know. 
But he comes and he confronts Eli regarding the, the end of God's tolerance for what Eli, the high priest, has allowed his sons to do. This is in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, verses 27 to 36. It says, One day a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. I revealed myself to your ancestors when they were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the priestly vest as he served me. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to your priest. So why do you scorn the sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? For you and they have become fat from the best offerings of my people Israel. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I promised that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priest, but I will honor those who honor me and I will despise those who think lightly of me. The time is coming when I will put an end to your family so it will no longer serve as my priest. All the members of your family will die before their time. None will reach old age. You will watch with envy as I pour out prosperity on the people of Israel, but no members of your family will ever live out their days. The few not cut off from serving at my altar will survive, but only so their eyes can go blind and their hearts break and their children will die a violent death. And to prove that what I have said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will establish his family and they will be my priests to my anointed kings forever. Then all of your surviving family will bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, give us jobs among the priests so we will have enough to eat. That's pretty hardcore. <laughs> In the next two generations, the pinnacle of Israel's glory is going to dawn. For the first time in history, a house of God will be built, the temple. The Levites, those charged with ministering the purposes of God, they'll find new prosperity, new purpose, a flowering of life that hadn't previously been found in Israel. So many good things are about to happen, but not for Eli, not for his house. The judgment of God meant that, that even as Israel ascends into a new era, Eli and his eras, his heirs, would descend. The whole family, all their birthrights, every part of life in the religious system that was given to them by, ver by birth was going to collapse. As Israel grows strong, the house of Eli would grow weak. And when we follow this, when we, we follow the fulfillment of this word from God over time in the books of First and Second Samuel, we, we find that this literally plays out in these two books. Even the descendants of Eli who survived this time period, they all die young. When the temple is built, it's not Eli's lineage that fills the office of the high priest. You know, David, he eventually builds the temple of God. But Eli's children, his descendants, don't, don't occupy the high priest role. It's a new priest named Zadok. And to emphasize it all, this mystery, nameless prophet of God, tells Eli to show you that this is the direct judgment of God on you and your house, not just coincident. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they're going to die on the same day. He would see it happen. Eli would. He'll see the collapse of his strength and all that he failed to steward in faithfulness. That's all coming. And that's the end of the prophecy. But God isn't done because, like I said, the judgment of the house of Eli is joined to the calling of Samuel. So as Eli descends, the new age of God's purposes in Israel is ascending. And we read about that in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. This, this chapter opens by noting Samuel's faithfulness, even amid the dreary spiritual climate of the day. Chapter 3, verse 1 of 1 Samuel, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. As if to emphasize the dismal spiritual environment, the very next verse finds Eli once again lying down. It mentions that he can't see. Now, that was a physical reality for Eli. He was, he was going blind in his old age. But it's also a spiritual rea reality for the, this high priest. This is a blind religious leader who's only living to die. And the judgment of God is on him, and it's just a matter of time. But this is where the call of God comes upon Samuel. And I want to read through these verses carefully because there's a lot of significant stuff in these verses. Chapter 3, verses 2 to 9 of 1 Samuel. One night, Eli, whose eyes 
were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now, Samuel's a little boy right here. But where do we find him? He's asleep in the tabernacle. Hannah had devoted her son to the service of God. Samuel owned that purpose. The tabernacle wasn't a hotel. People didn't sleep here. For Samuel, though, this was his life. He had prioritized the service, the presence of God in his life. And it wasn't out of the ordinary, apparently, for this young boy to fall asleep there. Even Eli was accustomed to that occurring. And then it happens. Verse 4, picking back up. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back, lie down. So he went and lay down. Now, I love this passage. First, we see the immediate, the reflexive response of Samuel to the voice of authority. He rises from his sleep. He hurries to Eli where he thinks the voice is coming from. But it's not Eli, of course. Samuel doesn't know the voice yet. He just knows it has authority in it. A lot of people picture prophecy as these guys, you know, going into a trance, staring at their belly button, drooling, ranting, humming, whatever. That's not how this young boy heard God, though. He was asleep, and the voice woke him up. The voice sounded familiar. It had the the hum of authority in it. I think the voice of God, when he speaks to us, often sounds more familiar than we realize. He seldom speaks to us through thunder and lightning. It's that voice we recognize. We may not know it fully, but when God speaks to us, it's usually familiar. The sound of his voice resonates in our hearts as something we're supposed to hear, something, a voice we're supposed to know. Picking back up on the reading, verse 6, Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up, went to Eli, and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Finally, Eli gets what's going on. He saw that Samuel wasn't just free labor in the house of God. God was waking up a call in this boy. For all his apathy, at least, Eli gave the boy the right direction on how to respond if the voice came again. And of course, it did come again. And when the voice called, Samuel did exactly what he was told to do. Speak, for your servant is listening. And God spoke. So I think a lot of us have heard God speak in our hearts. If we were asked to describe a moment God spoke to us, a lot of us could do that. I could. But the nature of this first word that God spoke to the boy Samuel... It's pretty incredible. It wasn't like something like, if you follow me, I'm going to bless you, or, or anything that would make the senses tingle. This was heavy duty, a major word from God, delivered to, to one who on the outside, in man's eyes, was just a boy. Verses 11 to 14 of chapter 3 in 1 Samuel. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. That's heavy stuff. And what followed? Well, Samuel had to present that word to Eli. When he woke up for breakfast the next morning, what was the word? What did God say? Well, God says he's about to to make you and your sons famous by the judgment he pours out on you. That's what happened. When you read it, that's exactly what happened right there. This was the crucible that birthed Samuel. Still a boy at this point, but he's a boy that heard God. And he grew and he developed. And before we get to the finale of what happened to Eli and his sons, chapter 3 closes out with these words. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. He let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all of Israel. He enters the ranks, the office of the prophet. His word carries the authority of the judgments of God. This is what marked Samuel as a judge, the last judge of Israel, in fact. 
Now, I can't help but wonder what would have been different if he hadn't gone through his development process correctly. What if he had dwelt on self-pity a little longer than he should have when he considered the loss of his family? What if he had ignored the voice and just stayed asleep that night? That's what Eli would have done. What if he had softened the message when he told Eli about it? He didn't know. Samuel could be trusted by God to receive, to transmit his, his word. He was a channel of integrity, no, no leakage, no slippage, accurate, true to the purposes of God. As for Eli and his sons, well, I bet you know that story. It's told in chapter 4 of 1 Samuel. The Philistines rise up in war against the Israelites, and they're, they're, the Philistines were this roving, seafaring nation that plagued the Israelites throughout the time of the judgments. We're going to look at them in greater detail in the next episode in this series. But here's these two armies, Philistines and Israelites, lining up for battle against one another, and the Philistines defeat Israel. So the heads of the Israelite army, they get together, and they try to figure out why would God let them lose the battle against the Philistines. And they remember, back in the old days, in the days of Joshua, when the Israelites were taking the land, the Israelites fought with the Ark of the Covenant in their midst. The presence of God was with them, and they couldn't be defeated back then. So, let's go back to that. So they send men to Shiloh, who secure the Ark of the Covenant. They bring it back to the battlefield. Now, it's not said in Scripture, but presumably, Eli let them take the Ark of the Covenant. He would have had to right? Because it was housed in the tabernacle there in Shiloh where he was at. So an important point is missed by the army and all of this. The generals, they missed the point. Even Eli misses the point. It was true that in the days of Joshua, the the, the Israelites went to war with the Ark of the Covenant carried with them. But the difference was God told them to do that. There's no voice of God guiding these warriors. They're looking to the Ark of the Covenant as some kind of talisman, a good luck charm, right? Superstition, the power of prior generations that their ancestors experienced was in the word and the presence of God, not just in this box. They missed the point. So did Eli, of course, this blind spiritual leader of Israel. And in that posture of missing the point, when the Ark of the Covenant comes into the camp of Israel, this roar of triumph rises up. It's so loud it nearly shakes the earth all around them. The Philistines across the way lining up for battle. They hear it, and their spies bring back reports about the Ark of the Covenant being in the camp of Israel. Well, now the Philistines are terrified. They believe God has come to fight with Israel. The ancient God, the one who defeated Egypt, led Israel in the conquest throughout the Promised Land, is coming to fight against the Philistines. So out of that terror, when they line up for battle, these Philistines assume they're all going to die. And so they fight like this is the end, like like, they're, it's do or die time, right? And as a result of that level of fighting, they win. The Philistines defeat Israel, and they even steal the Ark of the Covenant and take it home with them. First Samuel says 30,000 Israelite soldiers fell in this battle, including, in the same day, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, both dead, same day, just like the unnamed prophet said would happen. As the army of Israel is scattered, a messenger runs back to Shiloh. He tells the town what's happened. Eli hears a commotion. He doesn't hear the story. He's blind. He's sitting in a chair by the gate. And when the messenger comes to him, Eli says, what happened? What's going on? Eli isn't shocked by the death of his sons as the messenger relays the story. He's shocked by the loss of the Ark of the Covenant. On his watch, the presence of God has been forfeited from Israel. That's his final thought, his final realization. And the shock stuns him. He falls backwards in his chair and breaks his own neck by accident as his body piles up on top of his neck. And even with that final word, the story closes by letting us know the widow widow of uh, Phinehas, Eli's son. She's pregnant. And when she hears about Phinehas' death, her husband's death, she passes out and goes into premature labor. She dies giving birth, but just before she dies, she put a cap, she puts a capstone on this story, on this legacy of the house of Eli. And she names the newborn son Ichabod. You recognize that? That's from some that's a name in a famous uh, American literature, but Ichabod. The name literally translates to no glory or the glory has departed. Like God said to Samuel on the night when he first heard 
this word from the Lord. I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. This is like something, some kind of epic tragedy. In real life, it was the worst day the Israelites had experienced since they left Egypt. This is the epic story of the days of David. And that's the story of the rise of Samuel. In our next episode, we're gonna look back at Saul, to me, one of the most tragic and frightening figures in scripture. He's the picture of all that might have been, but but never was. The, the wrong turn and the forks that come our way in life when we choose what's best in the moment rather than what's in the purposes of God. That's what Saul represents. And that's next time, the next episode in our continuing series on the days of David. <laughs>